Well, I want to dive into our teaching. We're still in our Peace of Mind series, and uh, we've got just a couple of weeks left before we really get uh, Christmas focused as a church family. One thing that comes to mind is August Roden's famous sculpture, The Thinker. I don't know if you recognize this picture. Um, it's been copied. There's different images, different sizes all over the world. I think, I think some people say there's close to 30 statues or images just coming off of August Roden's original sculpture. It's mostly tied to, it's been used to, to uh, kind of be associated with philosophy. You can almost hear him just going, hmm, right? Can't you hear it? We just hear it right now. Um, the thinker is what it's called. Today's teaching topic makes me think of this. It also brings to mind this famous early 20th century self-help book. I don't know how many of you have read this or heard of it. Um, James Allen wrote a book called As a Man Thinketh. And his quote from this book I want to read is, As he thinks, so he is. As he continues to think, so he remains. I think that James Allen cheated. I think he got this right out of the Bible. The Bible that was the common translation early 20th century that everybody had was the King James old Shakespearean English version. That's all we kind of had. And that translation quotes the King Solomon in Proverbs 23 where he wrote, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. This connection between who we are, our identity, with what's going on up here. Today we're going to tackle another aspect of our mental health together. And again, we're going to go to the Bible. We're going to see what God has to say about it. We're not going to go to the self-help book. We're going to go to, to Scripture and wrestle with, okay, God, how did you make us? What are the, what are the, the ripple effects of the, the, the fall and our sin? What impact do our experiences have on the way we think and the way we live to get our thinking started uh, today, we're going to start with our, our talking. So I want to ask you this question. What do you say to yourself when you talk to yourself? I mean, we all do it. We all talk to ourselves. What do you say to yourself when you talk to yourself? And I'm not talking about the normal stuff like, don't forget the milk, don't forget the milk. She's going to kill me if I forget the milk. I'm not talking about, you know, those little pep talk moments. Don't forget the kids again. Don't forget the kids again. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Um, I'm talking about ongoing self-talk. The things that just keep, keep popping up in our brains, the way we talk to ourselves over and over again. What do you say when you talk to yourself? If you're like a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, you get stuck in a negative loop. Um, even some of you right now are going, well, that's not me. I'll bet if we think about it long enough, we, we can come up with some things that just keep coming back into each of our minds, unique to ourselves, that are negative, maybe even harmful. For example, if you're driving in traffic, you probably don't think, oh, man, God bless all these drivers. Right? I mean, what, what negative thought comes up in your mind? Can I just keep it real for a second? You know what comes up in my mind? These people are idiots. They're horrible drivers. Should I not have admitted that as a pastor, as a Christian? I mean, it's just, it's this negative, I will name it and claim it, it's a negative thought, not from God, that just seems to pop up consistently. In the morning, if you're like many people, you might think, oh, man, I've got so much to do today. And at the end of the day, you might think, oh, I didn't get anything done today. Anybody been in that loop? If you think about money, your negative self-talk might be, I'm never going to make it financially. If you think about relationships, some of you might just have this ongoing thought of, I just, I can't trust anybody. When you do something wrong, if you're like many people, you'll say something derogatory to yourself. Oh, you're an idiot. Stupid. You're always going to mess this up. And these negative loops just keep going on and on for, for all of us in some ways. So the question, what do you say when you talk to yourself? I think it really matters. 
I think it really matters. And the reason I ask this question is because what we say to ourselves, I believe, really matters. More than we can imagine. Scripture tells us this. King Solomon wrote this in Proverbs. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, to be really clear, whenever the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about this organ that's just a little bit off-center that pumps blood to the rest of our body. That's not what the Bible's talking about whenever it talks about our heart. It was, especially if we go back to when things were written in the Old Testament, the heart was seen as the center of our beings. So, so the heart is the center of who we are. Guard your heart. Guard what is central, what matters. For it determines the course of your life. Everything we decide to do comes from decisions out of our heart, out of our will. You could even, you could even phrase it that way. Our, our minds, you could even say. It all starts right here. This is why the Good News Translation, same proverb, this is New Living Translation, which we read out of most of the time here at Colonial, a different English translation of the, of the original Hebrew, the Good News Translation, puts it this way. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Same original Hebrew, just a different team of scholars saying, I, we're really talking about the center of who we are. You could argue that's our thinking. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Psychologists, I have learned, often call this the law of cognition. I don't want to nerd out too much, but what I've learned uh, about the law of cognition is it teaches that what we think impacts what we believe, which impacts how we feel, which impacts what we do. There's this ripple effect. What we think impacts what we believe, which impacts how we feel, which impacts what we do. It's all tied to our thinking. You could argue it starts with our thinking. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. I, I, we always learn more when we teach, right? When I'm preparing, when I'm, when I'm looking at Life Church's series that we've adopted for this teaching series, and I'm, I'm wrestling with it in my own life, I'm, I'm asking myself the question, okay, what are my strongest thoughts? That's where my life's going. What do I think about the most when I'm trying to go to sleep? What do I think about the most when, when, I, when I just pause in the middle of a day? That's where my life is headed. Be careful how you think, the Bible says. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. I like how uh, Dr. Paul David Tripp puts this. He, he's a really, really solid author and theologian, if you haven't heard of, of Dr. Tripp. But he says this in one of his devotionals. No one is more influential in your life than you are. Because no one talks to you more than you do. It's kind of funny, but I think it's true. No one is more influential in my life than me. Because nobody talks to, my, to me more than I do. I love that. Unfortunately, for some of us, we're talking ourselves into a life that we hate. Or that we're very dissatisfied with. So in light of that reality, I, I want to pause. Um, part of what we do is we sing, we pray, we read scripture, we wrestle with different thoughts from truths from, from the Bible. I want to stop and pray with you. Would you pray with me for just a moment? I think this matters. <sighs> Father, um, I, pray, I pray this is not just another half hour teaching. It's not just, it's not just a few bullet points of truth. I, I, I pray you would help us to change the way we think. I pray that you would help us resist the temptation to conform to the thinking, the patterns of this world. That's the natural drift for me, God. You know that. You watch it happen. And I pray that you would help me. I pray that you would help us overcome that and not be conformed, but we would be transformed. We would be changed by you renewing our minds, by you changing the way we think. Would you help us understand what our role is in that? How intentional we need to be with the work that's required? And would you, under, would you help us understand what's on you, what you, what you promise you will do supernaturally, and how those things come together? We need you. 
We want to be faithful. We want to experience this life to the full that you promise for us. We want to accomplish the things you call us to do and to be. And we know it starts with our mental health, with our, our wholeness. Please help, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen. Okay, let's have some quick audience participation this morning. Uh, how many of you would agree, unfortunately, that the world seems to be becoming more and more negative? Raise your hand if, if you genuinely believe that. If you don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but okay, okay. Even if you're home on the couch, I, I meant to say that. Just raise your hand, okay? I'm with you, I'm with you. The world does, at least to a lot of us, seem to become, be becoming more and more negative. Chronic negativity, we could say, is becoming an epidemic. Um, not just the last couple, three years um, related to pandemic and politics and vaccinations and all kinds of stuff like that. It's, I think it's just been this slow growth of negativity in my lifetime that seems very noticeable. And unfortunately, this isn't just a practical problem. I think at the root, you could argue it's, it's a spiritual problem. What I want to do today is give us a couple of foundational thoughts that we're going to come back to again and again together. First, I want to recognize this, this really powerful truth that our thoughts have incredible power. Our thoughts have incredible power. But the good news is that we have incredible power over our thoughts. Soak that up for a minute. Thinking really matters. Our thoughts are incredibly powerful. Our, our lives are, are moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. But the good news is we're not victims. We don't have to just go with the flow, go with this, this pull, this current. Especially with God's powerful help, we can actually change the way we think. Our thoughts are incredibly powerful. And we have incredible power over our thoughts. In fact, uh, Paul, the leader of the first Christians, said it this way in Romans chapter 8. He said, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. That's where a lot of us used to be, dominated by our sinful nature. Maybe it's where some of us still are. Paul is saying that those of us who live according to our, our flesh some translations say our sinful nature, we have our mind set on what the sinful nature wants. That's the bad news. But then he says the good news, the very next line. He says, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. God changes the way we think. I'm a 32-year-old Christ follower. Um, Learned a lot of stuff before the age of 20, but really the last 32 years, I have tried to faithfully follow Jesus. I've given my life to him. Thank God. I don't think the same way I did 32 years ago. And it's not just because I'm older and I got some gray. <laughs> God has changed the way I see the world. He's transformed what's important to me in a way that's even different than my 52-year-old friends and neighbors who don't know Jesus. It's not just getting older. It, it's spiritual. How does this impact you and me? Well, verse 6 says this from Paul. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. It's pretty strong language. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I've said it before the last few weeks. Who wants some peace? Who wants life? Anybody want to sign up for death? <laughs> no. If we are hurting... If we feel broken, if, if we struggle with discouragement, could it be, let's be honest with ourselves, could it be that our minds are set on the things of the world instead of set on the things of God? When our minds are set on the things of God, we will find life and peace in all that we do. Let's get a little practical with that truth in mind this morning. <clears throat> I want to I wanna take some time to, to show us how our negativity is not only hurting us, you probably can totally see that, but it's hurting the people around us. 
your negativity is hurting your family, it's hurting your friendships, it's hurting your marriage, it's hurting your values, it's hurting the direction of your life, it's hurting the way you see the world. It's, it's got this incredible power, not just in you in a vacuum, but in, in your world and the people around you. I want to show us why negativity is hurting us. I also want to try to help us. This might be the most practical thing you can walk away with today. I, I want each of us, hopefully, to walk away with a specific way we find ourselves struggling with negative thinking. And finally, I want to go to Scripture together. I want to show you um, just how, with God's help, we can change. So first of all, why is negativity so toxic? Why is it so bad? Well, I think you, me, and everyone else, we have a negativity bias. I know that's an opinion statement, um, but that's what I have just observed all around me. I, I, we can have that conversation if you really don't think everybody's bent that way. I think we have a negativity bias. We're all biased toward the negative. At least scientifically, neuroscience actually shows us that negative events imprint on our brains more quickly and stay longer than positive ones. That's just science. That's not an opinion statement. Isn't that fascinating? Neuroscientists study this and say that negative events imprint physically on our brains more quickly and they stay longer than positive ones. I can prove it pretty easily, I think. What do you guys think spreads more quickly on social media? <laughs> Something positive and beautiful or something negative? Of course, the answer is something negative. On any news app, what news stories get more clicks? Something negative, bad news, or something good and beautiful, good news? The answer is negative, right? I, I think I heard, golly, two, three, four decades ago watching some show, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, it's kind of a motto around news stations. Let's give them some bad news. It just sucks everybody in. If you've got some presentation coming up at school or at work, and, man, you finish it, and you have five people go, great job, nailed it. That was incredible. Way to go. That was amazing. And you have one person give you some negative criticism. What are you thinking about the rest of the day? Isn't that, isn't that powerful? That, that's my story too. We are, we are biased toward the negative. And what happens, unfortunately, is we can get in those loops. We can have this, this ongoing, this chronic negativity. And it can send us into a constant state of fight or flight. Now, I was reading about that and thinking about that. And I was, I was going, well, God, why'd you do that to us? Why'd you wire us that way? And actually, at first, that's a really good thing. God wired us. To react in that way, it's, it's not initially bad. It, it can become bad. But in stressful situations, God's actually designed our brain, I was reading this, to release cortisol into the blood system. This is where I start talking about things I don't know, but I'm, I'm reading this truth. God designed our brains to release cortisol into the blood system. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. At first, it makes us more alert. It makes us more focused. It makes us ready to deal with a problem. This is good until it's not. When we become chronically negative, where we're stuck in this ongoing negativity loop of thinking, we always feel like we're in danger. We always feel like there's some kind of threat. That's not what God intended for us. Remember, Paul wrote the words, in effect, the mind controlled by our sinful nature is death. The mind controlled by the Spirit of God is life and peace. There is a difference. What happens is when most of, most of us uh, see negativity online, most of, us say, most of what our friends say is negative. Most of what we say to ourselves is negative. Most of what we hear about in the news is negative. We, we start to focus on the negative. We're creating negative neural pathways. Remember, we've talked about that more than once over the last few weeks as we just wrestle with this, this reality of mental health. We are creating patterns physiologically in our brains of how to think. We're creating neural pathways. 
when we think a thought once, it's easier to think that thought again. And then again, and then it gets easier to think that thought again, and then it gets easier to think that thought again. It becomes a default posture. I was thinking about this. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of posture, and I don't mean I have good posture. I think I lean over a little bit, but I think there's, there's a posture we take into the world. That's why we do this here. That's why we do this here at Colonial, and we do this here at Colonial, and we do this here at Colonial. Because there's something about a posture we take, an attitude we bring to the world. Negativity can become our default posture. Go to work, and that's just who we are. Go to school, and that's what we bring with us. Come home at the end of the day, that's what we bring with us. Things are going to be bad. Things are just going to get worse. Can't trust anybody. Everybody's going to let me down. All Christians are like blank. This sucks. It's getting worse. I'm never going to get anywhere. I'm never going to be happy. And very literally, negativity becomes a default posture. If it's controlled, our thinking is controlled by our sinful nature. It leads to death. The news we consume. What, where, where are you getting your news? The news we consume. The shows that we watch. What shows are you watching? The lyrics to the music that we play. Over and over and over and over. It's amazing to me how sometimes I can struggle with memorizing scripture and I know all the words to all the songs. It's convicting. The social media that we consume that makes us feel left out, it makes us jealous, it makes us angry or less than. The, the people we spend our time with, who are you spending your time with? It all creates this inner script that we read over and over again that directs our lives. Our thoughts have incredible power over the direction of our lives. But again, I want to remind you, the good news is we have incredible power over our thoughts and where they are taking us. What if all of us today identify specifically where we are prone to negative thinking? If, if you can go here with me, this is, your, this is your own way of entering in to this teaching and engaging. All of us are prone to negativity in some way. There's a specific area of our lives where each of us kind of leans into negative thinking. Hopefully not more than one, but maybe for some of us, more than one. What is yours? I've heard it said, if you can't, if you can't name it, you can't, you can't defeat it, right? If you can't define it, you can't overcome it. What's holding you back? According to the experts, there are four big specific categories of negativity, areas of negativity. The first one is what I might call relational cynicism. Do you struggle with relational cynicism? What is this? Well, cynicism is a general distrust for people and their motives. You can't trust people. You know, they're going to take advantage of you. Everyone's out for themselves, right? All those people are blank, fill in the blank, all of them. No matter what you do, they're looking out for their own needs. Nobody's really generous. Nobody's really kind. You can't really trust people. There's relational cynicism. And for some of you, that would be the one you struggle with. But let's be honest with ourselves today. You might say, yeah, that's me. I am a relational cynic. I really don't trust people. I, I really think people are out for themselves all the time. There's another area of negativity, and it's called negative filtering. Negative filtering is seeing what's wrong. It's always, it's always finding the worst possible thing to point out. It's overlooking what's perfectly good, what's perfectly right, and it's assuming the worst, assuming the worst conclusion, assuming the worst outcome is coming. Kids are running late, and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope they're okay. What if something bad happened to them? And they've been late 18 times in a row, right? And they've been okay every time. But it's that negative filtering. 
or you get that text from your friend and, and you, you, you text your friend back and then they don't reply for like four hours and you think, well, I guess they don't like me. I guess they're mad at me. It's looking for what's wrong instead of looking for what's right and good. We see this a lot of times in a lot of different ways. Some of you who struggle with negative filtering, you can go on a vacation and you will find what's wrong with that vacation. You can go to a restaurant, you will find what's wrong at that restaurant. You can go to a church and you will quickly find what's wrong with that church. You meet somebody new and boy, pretty quickly you find what you don't like about that person. This is negative filtering. Another area of negativity is called absolute thinking. This is polarized thinking. It's, it's kind of the all or nothing way of thinking. It's, everything's black and white. There is no gray. There is no nuance. If a man hurts you, all men are bad. That's absolute thinking. If a woman lies once, all women are liars. If a Republican does something or a Democrat does something, that speaks for all of them. This is absolute thinking. If you make a mistake, you think to yourself, I'm just dumb. That's absolute thinking. If you disagree with someone about an issue, you write that person completely off. Everything. That's absolute thinking. I think we've struggled with this one just as a culture, especially the last two, three, four, five years. I think it's partly why we're so polarized, even in the church about different issues. Everything's black and white. Everything is all or nothing. Some of you, that's where you are. I think some of you are right here and you can't see it. That's a bold statement. That's between you and the Lord to wrestle with. Some of us are jerks to people, but we're right. <laughs> we're right. And I really believe this. Just because we're right doesn't mean we're honoring the Lord. Doesn't mean we're righteous. One last area of negativity the experts have said some of us struggle with is blaming. This is simply believing that you're always the victim. I don't think any of us want to admit that's where we are. I don't want to admit that. But I, I can fall into this, I think, a little bit. The reason where you are, where you are, is because someone else did something, got in your way, they took your toy, they didn't give you a chance, and you don't have any control. You feel like you have no control over what's happening to you. You're a victim of life and circumstances. World's against you. Which raises the question, if you find yourself constantly jealous or critical or discontent, or assuming the worst, or you're hard on other people, or you're negative about other people, or you're hard on yourself, having said all of these different things, can we change? Isn't that really where we want to land? I mean, this is all just kind of discouraging. It's too close to home for all of us in some ways. Can we change? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. But it's not easy not easy there was this ted talk that i was reading about i didn't see the talk i was trying to find it on youtube but i love the explanation of it and they took these these the groups of people these presenters took an imaginary new surgical procedure it was just made up this new surgical procedure and they divided this group up into two different big groups and to each group they explained the new surgical procedure and they wanted to ask them if it was a good procedure in their opinion or a bad procedure. And to the first group, they said, hey, hey, there's a 70% chance that this surgery will go really, really well. And then to the other group, they said, hey, 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 there's a 30% chance that this surgery is going to fail. Which is really saying the same thing, right? Just two different ways. 70% chance this is going to go well. 30% chance to the other group this is not going to go well. So they go to this first group. They say, okay, 70% chance this, this new surgical procedure is going to go really well. Do you think it's a good procedure 
or a bad procedure? And this group, the majority of them said, that sounds like a good procedure. Majority of them, not everybody, but most of them. They went to this other group and said, okay, okay, there's a 30% chance this new surgical procedure is going to go poorly. It's going to fail. Do you think this is a good procedure or a bad procedure? And the majority of them said, that's a bad procedure. It's not good. So then they decided to switch it. They decided to switch it. They, they went to the first group and they said, okay, we already told you there's a 70% chance that it's a good procedure, this new surgical procedure. But can I point out the obvious? There's a 30% chance it's not going to go well. It's going to fail. Do you, do you still think it's a good procedure? Or do you think it's a bad procedure? Guess what happened? The majority of this group thought what? It's a bad procedure. Oh, you know what? You're right. It's a bad procedure. Went to the other group. Switched it. Said, okay, we already told you there's a 30% chance this new surgical procedure is going to go really poorly. It's going to fail. But, but I want to state the obvious. There's a 70% chance it's going to go well. It's going to be good. Do you want to change your stance? Is it a good procedure or a bad procedure? What do you think they said? No, they still thought it was a bad procedure. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Which proves to us that you can change your perspective. You can change the way you look at it. But to change from negative to positive is not natural. To change from negative to positive is not accidental. It doesn't just happen. Back to that negativity bias that we have. We might just need a little help from God. We might need supernatural help to change this way of thinking. This is why I don't want to recommend any self-help books today. Try harder. We might need some help that only God can provide. And, and we might need to be pretty intentional on our own. What's our part to play? We might have to work at this a little bit. So how do we do it? How do we practically change? I want to look in the Bible, very much on purpose, at one of the most powerful illustrations of the mind we have with David. I love that we studied David, I think it was last year, time flies, it may have been the year before last, um, the best, the most amazing king in the history of Israel, a man after God's own heart. We're going to look at how he struggled up here in the mind and what to do when we are hit, when we are overwhelmed with negativity. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 30. Um, so if you want to grab a Bible, if you don't already have one, or if you're following along in the message notes in the app, we've got the scripture there. 1 Samuel 30. Let me give you some context before we read a few verses of this passage together. This was a really bad day. We're, we're interrupting, we're stepping back into history, into this day of David's life. It was a really, really bad day. It was worse than you're thinking. It was worse than, than anything you can think of, really. However bad your week was this past week, I guarantee you, David's week was worse. He and his troops had just come home from battle, and check this out, they tragically discovered that enemy forces had come and burned their homes, kidnapped their wives, and their children. I cannot imagine. We won. Won the battle. Come home. Your homes are gone. Your loved ones are gone. David thinks it can't get any worse. And it did. His own men decided to turn on him and try to kill him. They were so distraught, so upset, they blamed their leader. Let's just read it. 1 Samuel 30, starting in verse 3, says, When David and his men saw the ruins... And realized what had happened to their families. They wept until they could weep no more. You ever done that? Some of us in the room have done that. We have wept until we, are, we have no more liquid in the body. We can't cry anymore. This is what they did. It was that bad. And, and, and look at verse 6. David was now in great danger. Because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him, of killing their leader. I don't know where you're coming from today. I don't know where. Maybe we've got some people online as well that 
Some of us are doing good. We had a great Thanksgiving. We're refreshed. Some of us right now are hurting. I know that. Any given moment, you journey with a, a big group of people. Some of you really hurting right now. You're really anxious about things. You've got, you've got this very real sense of fear and, and feeling overwhelmed. They wept until they could weep no more. I have to believe David was... How do, how do you describe? I, I, can, I can only guess David was freaked out. Sad, confused, broken-hearted about his own loss, overwhelmed by his own men wanting to kill him. And in the middle of this worst and lowest moment, the scripture says this, but David found strength in the Lord his God. That is not a Hallmark card. That is not a trite little saying. Fact. Worst possible moment. Lowest moment. Had to be. Of his life, I would guess. David found strength in the Lord, his God. In the middle of an avalanche of negativity. He found strength in God. The, the one other English translation, um, I believe it's the King James actually, the in King James English says he found encouragement in God. For some of us in a world of chronic negativity, it's time for us to learn to find strength in God, to find encouragement in the Lord. What did David say in that moment? No idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. I wish, I wish the Bible just unpacked the next 48 hours of David's life in that moment. And we don't know what he said. But we do know what he said at other times of being really low. Very likely what he said at other times is similar to what he said to himself in this moment. So let's, let's look at some examples. Psalm 103, the first few verse, verses, David was talking to himself. He was encouraging himself. In the Lord, and he said this, he said, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. In the worst moments, in the lowest moments, to choose to remember what God has done in the past. It's why we do these recentering prayers. It's not some colonial gimmick. It's a moment every time we come together in this room to say, can we just stop, no matter what we're feeling, no matter what's going on in our worlds, can we stop and say thank you? Can we just choose to remember, okay, the last six months have sucked, God, but I do remember when you did this. I do remember the gift you gave me in him or her. I do remember the ways you've come through for me in the past. This is what David is saying. Verse 3, he forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. How easy is it to forget about forgiveness when we're just sad, when we're just frustrated? He forgives us. He redeems me from death, crowns me with love and tender mercies. David's going, I remember the lion. I remember the bear. <laughs> I remember Saul. Wow, I, I remember you coming through for me. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. I don't know what that means, but that sounds really cool. <laughs> Maybe you've heard this next thing David prayed and remembered. This is in that same psalm, Psalm 103, a few verses later, verse 8. David said, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Anybody heard that golden nugget before somewhere? Yeah? Does that sound familiar? This wasn't a one-time thing for David. That must sound familiar to a lot of us. He also said that very similar thing in Psalm 86, verse 15. He says, but you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. You ever heard that before? 
that sound familiar? Was it a different verse of scripture you're thinking of? Because I don't think David was very creative. He just kept saying this in different places. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. You ever heard that before? Is this starting to ring a bell? David's not that creative. He just keeps saying these same things. And evidently, this is what David said when he was talking to himself. What do you say when you talk to yourself? God is good. God is filled with love and grace. He's slow to get angry. God is gracious. He's compassionate. He said it over and over again. And guess what? David didn't make that up. You know where he got that? He plagiarized. You know David plagiarized? Ripped that off from God. God said it. We can go back to Exodus 34. God was the first one to say this. This is who I am. So what's interesting to me, this is important. What's interesting to me is when things got really bad, David relied on what he'd already hidden in his heart. Truth from God. When things get really bad for you, what's already there? that comes out. David encouraged himself in the Lord. I want to finish today with, I love this idea from Craig Grishel. I hope this is really encouraging to you. This may be the only thing some of us remember from today's teaching. I want to give you a tool. I want to give you something you can step into. This imagery I think is really going to work for a lot of us. I want you to start acting like a cow. I want you to be a cow. There's a lot of reasons that could go south. Okay, but let's let's humor me. Unpack unpack this with me for a minute. What does a cow do? Okay, I did not see that coming. Why? How could I not see that coming? Wow, geniuses! Did you hear how? Did you guys hear? By the way, I, this is not in my script. Did you hear how the Aggie died drinking milk? Cow fell on him. Okay. That was as bad as I thought it would be. Back up with me. Let's finish strong. What does a cow do? Don't move. One of the things a cow does is something called ruminating. I think I knew this, but I forgot. A cow ruminates, which is really, really cool. What does a cow do? A cow takes a mouthful of grass and chews it and chews it and chews it and chews it and then swallows it. And then you can guess what the cow does next, right? The cow throws it up and then chews it some more and chews it and chews it and swallows it. And often a third, fourth, fifth time will throw it up and chew it and chew it and chew it and swallow it. Besides being really cool, um, that's really gross, right? (laughs) Maybe more gross than cool. Why does the cow do that? It's not, it's not because they're not, I mean, they're not the brightest animals in the world, but it's not, it's very purposeful. We have learned this is a way for them to get all the nutrients out of the grass. Everything they need. A cow ruminates. There's some Hebrew words in scripture, one of the Hebrew words that's often translated into, in the Old Testament, into meditate. It's sometimes even translated into that English word, ruminate. To ruminate on something, to meditate on it, to chew on it, to enjoy it, to get everything out of it you possibly can get. All of the spiritual nutrition. Let's apply that to the Bible. Let's apply it to Scripture. What we can get out of it over and over and over and over again. So when you find yourself in a hard situation, you don't have to Google. (laughs) You don't have to wonder, I wonder what God has to say about that. I wonder how God feels about this situation for me. Because you've already been meditating on it. You've already been ruminating on it. I think, also not in my script, I think... I am overwhelmed with the reality that most of us Christians in 2022 
at least in our culture here in Texas, America, the West, we are not students of Scripture. And I'm not saying that to shame on you. I'm not saying that to wag my finger. I'm pleading with you as your brother in Christ. The more time you spend like a cow ruminating on the Bible, ruminating, meditating, chewing on truths from Scripture, you are going to think differently. It's going to change the direction of your lives. Do you get that? Our thoughts are incredibly powerful, and we have power over our thoughts. We'll finish this way today. Earlier we went over the four big categories, you could say, four areas of negativity. I, I want to I take spiritual truth on each of those four areas and even ruminate on it together with you today. Some truth we can say over and over again with each other. Let's, let's do this practice together. Would you please stand with me today? We're going to look at these four areas of negativity. Um, if you want to take a picture with your phone, totally appropriate. If you want to go back online and look at them, appropriate. They're also in the message notes today. But I want to slowly walk through these four areas of negativity. And I, these are things that I think it's truth from Scripture that we can say over and over again. You know, maybe already, which one of these four areas of negativity you struggle with. Maybe there's someone you really care about that you think struggles with one of these four areas. Maybe all of them apply to some of us. If you battle, if you find yourself battling with cynicism, you may say this over and over again. In fact, I'd, I'd like for us just to read and pray these words out loud together. Join me, please. With God's help, I will get rid of all bitterness and skepticism. I choose to believe the best about others and be kind, compassionate, and loving. I will love and forgive others as Jesus has loved and forgiven me over and over and over again. If your struggle is negative filtering, you might say this. Let's read and pray this out loud together. God, by your power, I take every thought captive and make it obedient to the truth of Christ. Because you're good, I choose to think on what's good, right, true, helpful, and worthy of praise. As I trust in you, your peace will guard my heart soul, and mind in Christ Jesus. If you find yourself lost in absolute thinking, everything's black or white. All these people are this or that. We can tell ourselves this. Let's read and pray this out loud together. As Jesus loved and accepted me, I will love and accept others. Rather than always being right, I'm called to always be loving. Rather than just making a point, I choose to make a difference. In humility, I choose to love others above myself. Finally, if you find yourself often a victim, blaming. Let's all read and pray this out loud together. God has given me a life and a mind of my own. By his grace, I will own my choices and choose God's best for me. I've been given everything I need to accomplish everything God wants me to do. In Christ, by his power, by his blood, by his stripes, by his spirit, I will overcome. Let's pray together. Father, I, I pray, whether it's these moments we can speak truth to ourselves, whether it's moments we can learn habits and rhythms of being in your word, whether it's just downright supernatural that you do despite 
our drift, our sinful drift into negative thinking, Lord, all the ways that are possible, we, we beg you to change the way we think. We beg you to bring life and peace into our, our lives. Coming out of a holiday, coming out of a break, um, I, I have to believe a lot of us are going, oh, got to get back in the grind. Oh, life's going to speed up again. Would you, would you help us just be grounded in you, grounded in thinking how you want us to think? Lead us, God, please. We don't just thank you for a ticket out of hell. We thank you for an invitation into life here now. Change us, Father. Have your way with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.